Uh, thank you all for coming um, and going through. I know there was detours and you have to go through around. Uh, uh, it was quite a trek and I think it's worth it uh, to listen to this talk. Uh, so I was very happy uh, when I was asked uh, to introduce Professor Mustafa Minawi uh, for this uh, ICM talk. Uh, Mustafa, of course, has been here at Cornell for about six years now. Uh, and we're very, very lucky to have him uh, as both a friend and a colleague. Uh, Professor Minawi is currently working on uh, several innovative monographs connecting East Africa, especially Ethiopia, uh, with uh, the Ottoman core. Uh, his first book, which is displayed right here, so if you didn't get your copy, please do. Uh, I think he gets like 90 cents per copy. So, uh, yeah, so you definitely buy it. Uh, so his first book, uh, The Ottoman Scramble for Africa, was published last year by Stanford University Press. A recent review of his book uh, in the AHR, the American Historical Review, states, Minawi writes with passion and precision, and he has uh, produced an accessible and thought-provoking book. Today, Professor Minawi will be presenting what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking paper, uh, and the paper is titled, uh, Juridical Colonialism, International Law, uh, and the Ottoman Response. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Minawi. I'll collect it later. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for ICM for having me, and uh, thank you Ziad for this very generous introduction. Um, uh, so what I'm going to be presenting today is really a work in progress, and this is not. I know how people always say, "Oh, it's a work in progress," so people will judge them less. It really is a work in progress. So um, it's it's kind of a transition from uh, one project into another, and they are tied. And I'm trying to figure out uh, how they are tied. I'm working it out as we speak, and I think it will show in the presentation. Uh, but I will not leave. Uh, I will not start from the moment um, that I started looking at my second project because the second project in many ways is tied to the first project. Without some grounding in the first project, a lot of what I'm going to say might not make sense. Uh, and I'm not going to assume that you read the book. <laughs> um, it is 2399, as I was saying. Is. <laughs> I don't know if it's good when your book goes on discount or not, but uh, it's um, thanks for the holidays. Anyway. Um, so uh, what I'm what I'm gonna do is kind of try and pull you into this uh, world of late 19th century Ottoman uh, diplomacy and intrigue, um, and uh, th that's partly why I'm using some of the maps that the Ottomans themselves, that the officers themselves were using. Um, uh, I, there is very a uh, view with. I mean, just the fact that it's written in Ottoman, I think you can still follow it. It's, I mean, obviously it's a world map, uh, but it also has very different uh, delineation of, the, of whose territory is where, uh, based on the Ottoman perspective of what is under their own sovereign rule, what is under their own legal colonial rule, and what is not, which uh, I will show later in the presentation is very different than um, conventional, not conventional, British, if you know what you're talking about. Um, so I'm going to start with, oh, wait. Yeah, maybe this will work. Let's hope it works. I forgot their sound. So actually, to understand what's going on, since a lot of what, a lot of, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is actually um, uh, uh, legal arguments that the Ottoman Empire is going to be making first for colonial possessions and second for protecting its sovereign territory in East Africa, we have to go back to, w to understanding how at the, in, at the end of the 19th century and uh, the uh, European powers understood who has the right to take advantage of international law and who does not. Uh, who does international law apply to, and who does it not? And they are very clear about the fact that it, it will apply to those that they consider, quote, civilized, or in this case, European, and that has a lot of ramifications, and we don't even need to talk about those that we don't consider civilized, and thus we don't need to even, they're not even part of the conversation, and later on, they're not, they're, their sovereign rights are not protected. Late 19th century. The Ottoman Empire, fortunately or unfortunately, in 1856, was officially let in um, uh, through a lot of pomp and circumstance. Uh, they, they, uh, after the end of the Crimean War, the Ottoman Empire was accepted as part of the Concert of Europe, or the family of nations. So basically, they, uh, 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 legally, the European powers accepted the sovereignty of the Ottoman Empire 
as a European empire. If it wasn't accepted as a European empire, their sovereignty would not have been accepted. This, uh, become, uh, this immediately becomes an issue when the Ottoman, represented by this very lovely gentleman in the center of, the, of this drawing, uh, I use a lot of um, uh, pictorial representations from the period because I think they're very interesting and you'll see why. Here, the Ottomans are actually represented as being in the center of, of, this, of this family of nations. They're the new ones coming in, they're signing the Peace Treaty of, uh, of Paris, and they are being accepted officially into a modern European family. But that means if you're accepted into a modern European family, your sovereignty should be respected. Immediately there's a problem because the, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, most of you would know in the 19th century there, their legal sovereignty internally was not respected officially through the capitulations. So what people do not know is that immediately after the Paris uh, um, conference, there was supposed to be a follow-up conference in Istanbul to talk about actually getting rid of, the, of, of these. That never happened. Things are very different in 1878. So between 1856 and 1878, a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of territories lost, and a lot of sovereignty challenged. Instead of actually reducing the presence of the European powers in, in the Ottoman Empire or re, re, um, reducing their notions of uh, 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 implementing European legal understanding of sovereignty inside of the Ottoman Empire, it actually increased. I'm sorry if I just confused people, I just did it backwards. Uh, it actually increased so that in many ways the sovereignty of the Ottoman Empire internally was being challenged continuously and by 1878 I was pushing like 35 years, but by 1878, uh, there is, uh, after the loss uh, of a huge war to the Russians, yet another Russian war, uh, and the risk of actually losing not just uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire, essentially Istanbul, the, fr the great powers in uh, interfered for their own benefit because they didn't want uh, 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 Russia to take the, uh, the full pie, and they, uh, they stopped the war. Consider, and, and we have the very famous Congress of Berlin. In the Congress of Berlin, another peace treaty was signed, but also uh, the, the signing uh, uh, of it meant that the Ottoman Empire had to give up the heart of the Ottoman Empire. I, I say this in my class, I strongly believe that the heart of the Ottoman Empire is not Anatolia, and it's not the Arab world, it's the Balkans. When the Balkans are given up, the heart is ripped out. They actually talk about it that way in the press. And there's a lot of lamentation for years. It happens again in, 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 in 1912 when there's another Balkan war. During this period, a lot of the Balkan part of the Ottoman Empire was, was either um, uh, taken away completely, uh, like de declared independent, fell under Russian uh, uh, sovereignty, or uh, went into a state under Ottoman sovereignty but was on its way to becoming independent, became a principality. Bulgaria, for instance. I want you also to pay attention to this picture, 1878. That's again the, 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 the deal that they're discussing is actually that they're shaking hands over the loss of Ottoman territory. What's interesting is that they're representing uh, the Ottomans again. Um, this is in a German. This is a German painting that was given to the to uh, to the uh, German Chancellor as a gift. But they represent the delegation from the Ottoman Empire as being literally marginalized, <laughs> back against the wall. But you can still recognize their faces. Um, you can tell, actually, if every person that is important, you can still see that they are individuals and you can actually match them. We know the, the names of these folks. Uh, things are about, so they're getting marginalized, but they're not quite, they haven't quite disappeared from a European uh, uh, family of nations. Just to give you a sense of what they lost, everything that is in yellow between 1856 and, 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 uh, um, and 1878. Um, what is left is, is what we call Rumeli, uh, soon Albania will be gone as well, but that's for much later. Immediately, this is, this is just a quote from 1882, but there is this notion, there is almost two camps in the Ottoman Empire, there is the, the camps in Istanbul, those that are still lamenting the Balkans, uh, lamenting the loss of the Balkans, wanting to return the Balkans to the Ottoman Empire, and those that are saying, get over it, let's do something different. We need to play the game differently. And in this case, this dude, Farid Muhammad Zaki Pasha, whenever I say Mehmet, and, and people really get angry because he's actually an Arab. People are like, there's an Arab, don't make it. Anyway, 
Sophie <laughs> Mohammed Seki Pasha <laughs> from Tripoli uh, wrote, uh, actually he was kind of exiled, but whatever. Uh, he wrote to the Sultan, he wrote a very long, you know, we love you, I can't believe you exiled me, but this is my advice. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and he says, if Istanbul were to spend the effort, it would solidify our hold over a territory equivalent in size to the Balkan provinces that we lost. He's talking about Central Africa. Mm -hmm. And with his good grace, we would never lose this territory the way we lost the Balkans. Because he makes the argument that they're Muslims and thus they are naturally uh, loyal to the, to the Sultan. This is uh, one of the many kind of advices that I found in the, in the archives that people have not paid attention that much to because they think it's just like another person sending an advice to the Sultan. That are, that are where it's saying let's switch strategy from looking west to looking south. Um, what I ended up finding is that they, they took that very seriously. And uh, between 1878 and 1885, Again, in Berlin, things have changed drastically in the way the Ottomans started to perceive themselves, at least they present themselves, to their European counterparts. Notions of a colonial empire, in some cases, were being used, something that they didn't use in the past. So the idea that we're different than the, Brit than the British and the, uh, and the French empires, because our empires, our empires are divided into provinces. Our provinces are represented in a parliament, or at least until it was hanged. And, and, uh, 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 but we, these are, they are essential part of our empire. They are Ottoman, they might be Albanian or, or Greek or uh, Arab or Yemeni, uh, but they are part of the Ottoman Empire. There's something that is switching though here. They're using a new language, not just a new language, a new strategy. This strategy uh, is uh, their window into this uh, is really a kind of uh, their window of opportunity is the Conference of Berlin. The Conference of Berlin in 1884, 1885, which a lot of you know, is usually known as the Conference of Berlin to divide Africa. Uh, you know, there's always these caricatures of you know Europeans dividing a big cake that looks like the shape of Africa. It wasn't, of course, a conference to divide Africa. It was a conference to set the rules on how to divide the rest of Africa. And the, and the distinction is very important. Uh, so it's not just a bunch of people that were sitting around and really taking a shot. It's not that image that we have of, of Sykes-Picot and you know that dividing of it. it. This is about people that were in competition, European states that were in competition for whatever is left of Africa, mostly uh, the, uh, the, the, the inland. Uh, and they were on the verge of starting to fight over what they believed should be ones or the, the others. And this conference was there to set basically the rules on how not to fight with one another over someone else's land. Uh, they didn't think of it that way. Uh, they, but, they, what they, <laughs> but really what they thought of it is that actually legalizing, putting, like putting uh, the idea of colonizing another place not as for economic advantage or cultural arguments, but as a legal argument. Mm. You create the law, you enforce the law, and thus it's legal. In this case, the law it only applies to the Europeans, and the people that are the, the locals, of course, are not represented or counted because they are not part of the civilized family of nations. So there's very real, substantial. Um, and the effect to this idea of what law or international law is starting to shape, who's shaping it and for what purpose. Um, what's good is that the Ottomans, whether they like it or not, are still considered European. Once you're in, it's very hard to kick you out. But you can do other things that make it very difficult. So this is another representation. Find the Ottoman. Really find the You can see, I don't know, can you see him? Yeah, so this is really, I love the representation. So now he's an abstract figure <laughs> represented, the Ottoman delegation is an abstract figure represented by one man with no face and a fez. Uh, and I assure you, they were a lot more than one. I know that they are, like, it's a delegation. And they were very much part of the discussions and they are the ones that actually signed the agreement at the end. And they had the most to lose and gain from the Act of Berlin. And I'll tell you how. This is another one of those. Again, find the Ottoman. You see him? Is it really good here? What, what is the pixel like? Oh, you see him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, there he is. <laughs> so, uh, it's, I, I love those representations. <laughs> um, again, it's, uh, this is supposed to be Said Pasha. If you know Said, I mean, anyway. Uh, he's, <laughs> uh, the dude is, 
uh, first of all, he doesn't travel light. Like he's, he will have like a delegation, and he will be in full, you know, whatever. He really looks like he has a hangover, and he's isolated. <laughs> the isolation is very interesting. Like, yeah. and also the abstraction. We don't see his face. It's just a bearded man with a fez. Uh, that kind of matches a lot of the way even policymakers are starting to depict the Ottoman Empire, especially since law is involved. I'll hopefully explain. One act I want you to remember from the, from the Act of Berlin, uh, two, two doctrines that are very, very important that become the, kind of the driving engine behind legal argumentation for, for, uh, a gay, uh, for claiming new tracts of land, particularly in Africa, that European powers that are there and signing the document at the end are supposed to, st to stick to are the hinterland doctrine and the effective occupation doctrine. There's others, but these are really the most important ones because it allows you to claim new land. What is the hinterland doctrine? In this case, it is about, uh, in very simplistic terms, it is the notion, actually it is simplistic. The way they write it is vague as hell, so somebody else can interpret it and, and people with teeth can interpret it better than people without. Uh, they, they talk about uh, any uh, uh, empire that already possesses a land along uh, the coast, has the first dibs on, uh, on occupying the hinterland of the land, of the land that is in the back of that coast, because it would, uh, theoretically, it's supposed to be tied already socially and economically to the, so the well-being of that land that they have already occupied along the coast would require that they get first dibs, and from this point forward, you have to prove effective occupation. You cannot go in, stick a flag, and leave. Um, uh, which a lot of them did. Uh, so what they would, uh, from this point forward, you cannot go, you know, we, we got here first, um, you know, in the name of the queen, whatever, uh, king, whatever. Uh, it's, you stick up, and uh, unless you actually have boots on the ground, uh, unless you have boots on the ground, <laughs> I love that term, um, <laughs> or you have, you, essentially like um, settler colonialism, but with soldiers, you uh, that are permanently there, we will not recognize that this piece of land that you've already claimed can stay uh, yours, European power. But we'll make exceptions when it is really harsh on your skin. So, it's, uh, so for Africa in terms of seriously, uh, the, the, in, the, uh, this would apply to the places that are where temperate temperature or whatever that uh, that are more suited to a European uh, uh, whatever. Uh, uh, so for Africa, they make exceptions that are very, very critical, mm -hmm. for the, uh, for particularly for Saharan Africa. Uh, because they are so difficult for a European to stay there permanently, what they do is that you have to prove the effective occupation through infrastructure, through the physical presence of the metropole there. And that usually is, is uh, either that you start, you start finding it, both French and British building trains to nowhere, telegraph lines, uh, uh, castles, even having ceremonial uh, inauguration there that where they would stick a flag and there would be a thing. But it, the important thing is that you should be permanently there. It is yours and it's tied to the metropole somehow. The Ottomans get on that game as well because it's very cheap to stick two pieces of wood and a, and a string. It's probably the cheapest way to actually prove effective occupation through infrastructure. And the Ottomans go to town on it. Uh, like they just start building what they what a lot of people criticize them for, which is uh, from Tripoli and Benghazi, they start building uh, telegraph lines to what they call the middle of nowhere, to oases in the middle. That way, you're physically connected, but your but the presence of the Ottoman Empire is there, whether there is a man from the Ottoman Empire or not. Um, so the rules are changing a little bit. Uh, the Ottomans, the hinterland doctrine for the Ottomans particularly was very important. Um, because they, for them, uh, when they when they recognize the sovereignty or, or the right of, of Europeans to what they already have by signing this document, effectively they've given up their claim to Algeria and Tunisia, which were already under uh, uh, French occupation. But everybody <coughs> recognized that they are still the sovereigns in, in Tripoli, in the province of Tripolitania, uh, the tr troubles gutter which is uh, made of Cyrenaica, Tripolitania, and Fezzan. Uh, but, uh, and, but what the Ottomans said, not, this was not enough. What they really wanted, the, the bargain is that they have the right to the hinterland of Libya. 
The hinterland of Libya, as defined by the Ottomans, is connected economically and socially with the Sudanic kingdoms that are around the Lake Chad Basin. That was, in, in some, their, their territorial claim, and that was their legal claim to their territory. Um, I will talk about this a lot more. So this is essentially what we're talking about. Um, so uh, you can tell the difference between uh, an Ottoman map and a European map. Um, and, Ottoman, and they're from the same year. Uh, this is, uh, so just for, so the, the Sudanic kingdoms that you're talking about are Bagirmi, Gorno, Kanem, and Wadai. Uh, they call them Sudanic kingdoms, they call them sultanates. Borno um, uh, Kanem is sometimes attached again. So, uh, but they are uh, 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 sovereign uh, territories that are ruled locally, but that are directly connected to uh, uh, the Ottomans argue to the hinterland of Libya. They are the hinterland of Libya, and the way you pr you, you are going to prove I'm, I'm jumping through my whole book essentially in two seconds right now. The way that you are going to prove that this is. Uh, 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 legally, uh, 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 effectively occupied is not by uh, uh, sending troops, but by dealing with the local uh, inhabitants there that they will give their allegiance to, uh, that they will give, who will give their allegiance to the Ottoman Empire. Um, so, more or less, everything that you see kind of colored in, in salmon, odd color, uh, for uh, whatever, uh, is, uh, is, is considered to be not just Ottoman territory, but also an Ottoman sphere of influence. They actually, the, they have a direct translation of sphere of influence into Ottoman, which I love. Uh, but uh, because that word now, sphere of influence, mustamlakat, colony, uh, all of the, uh, they are words that they have to be very careful about when they use them and when they do not use them because uh, you do not want to give up sovereignty over Ottoman Empire proper through your claim to, ter to new uh, territories. Um, even the word hinterland, they actually adopted as is hinterland. Uh, <laughs> um, one thing I want you to, to notice before I move on from this map is that uh, what is the one territory that the British and the French and the British and the Ottoman agree on in terms of their in the way they envisioned the world in East Africa? I don't know why I'm doing this as if I'm teaching a class. Can you tell It's Abyssinia. It's uh, Ethiopia. That is incredibly important, and that's where <coughs> my next project starts. So it's incredibly important because at 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 one point, particularly in the mid 1890s, both the British and the Ottomans recognize the sovereignty of, of Ethiopia not uh, for several reasons. They actually won it by power, but they are both going to have to try and find a way to get Ethiopia on their side to support their claims to Somalia. Um, I will talk about that in a second, but I just wanted, because the, the other map does not show it as well, I just wanted you to uh, take note. Do you remember when I said that they, one way that they are proving that they have a legal title to, uh, to new colonial possessions in Central Africa is through d d dealing with the local inhabitants? It sounds so kind of like exotic. It's really they're dealing with the Sufi order. That does sound exotic. And they're, dealing <laughs> <laughs> they're dealing with the Senussi Sufi order. It's really not that exotic at all. It's not like, you know, whirling dervishes. It's the Senussi uh, order is, is really a state within a state. Uh, it is a state that is designed for a, in a non-conventional space for mostly nomadic or semi-nomadic population that lives there, that pledges its allegiance to the Senussi, so they become Senussi themselves, as a Sufi leader, but also as a leader that actually organizes everything from uh, the, uh, the um, relationship between the different tribes, the economic uh, caravan routes, which are very, very important. The most important economic factor is the slave trade, so he keeps the slave trade actually happening even after it becomes illegal. Um, so the livelihood of the people, the south and north, actually continues. And he has physical <coughs> infrastructure that stretches all the way down to the Lake Chad Basin. You can, I don't know, I don't actually have those, I'm going to talk about that much, but here. All these dots are actually uh, physical structures that are called lodges, but they are really schools and hospitals and so on, that the, that the Tenusi order actually has in, 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 the, in the hinterland of Libya. So what the Ottomans do, 
and I'm gonna I have to go really quick with this because I don't want to get stuck here. Is they send this lovely gentleman uh, as one of the many people, but he's the guy that I follow. They they follow this uh, this man and uh, Edemasi in Istanbul who can speak Arabic and German and French and. To meet with the Senussi Sufi order only immediately after the Conference of Berlin to try and secure this alliance with the Senussi to claim uh, uh, effective occupation, effective occupation by proxy, essentially. If you have, I'm not going to go into what does that mean. He's not an intermediary. This is not a. This is not the situation. It's actually quite particular. I would love if you have questions about it. I will. I will talk about it uh, after. What I really want to jump to is how things fall apart. So it seems that, uh, I told somebody the other day that everything it seems I work on it eventually ends up failing. <laughs> Not my project, but I think I'm interested in things that never happen, <laughs> that never eventually actually <laughs> succeed, uh, because they're more interesting. People always work on things that succeed. Anyway, uh, in this case, the Ottomans were very much pushing for this, for this uh, colonial possession. Um, uh, at, through diplomatic means, as well as through on the local level. I'm going to skip the local level, I'm going to go back to the diplomatic means, that where they, they the Istanbul establishes um, uh, illegal office uh, that churns out uh, uh, legal argumentation using modern international law ideas that the diplomats can use and deploy when they're talking with their counterparts in, in Europe, particularly about why this hinterland belongs to them. Yet, uh, so between 1885 and 1890, they are really claiming what, what, I, what I termed juridical colonialism, which is really sounds pretentious, but I, I was just talking about how it is really kind of a claiming a, a colony not by being there and not through economic means and not through power, but through legality. We signed this agreement, this is international law, and according to this agreement, which we're both part of, which applies to both of us because we're both European, this, this should belong to us. Um, the argumentations are sound if you actually follow that kind of twisted logic, but by 1890, uh, uh, it more or less falls apart in a very kind of sad, depressing way. Uh, um, let, me, let me read you a little bit about some of the correspondences that happen and some of the, the, the intricacies of, of how the, how the performance of diplomacy is almost as important as the legal argument you are using. So a lot of the performativity, I should say, of diplomacy is as important as the... Both of them do not believe that the other person is actually saying the truth, but both of them have to remain part engaged in this, in this, in this game because stepping outside of the game might threaten your existence, particularly in the Ottoman case. Um, let me, let me, allow me to read. What time is it? I feel like there's no clock. And how am I doing? 523. 523. I don't know what does that mean. <laughs> You're oh, fine okay, for time. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> on, uh, October, uh, on, a, in August 1890, the Ottoman ambassador in Paris reported that negotiations were taking place between London and Paris in order to reach a bilateral agreement on their respective spheres of influence in Africa and to delineate uh, the borders of their protectorates, particularly in Central Africa. This was of particular importance to Istanbul since part of the agreement was concerned with the Central African kingdoms that I just mentioned in the Lake Chad Basin. The British and the French agreed that the area south and west of the Lake Chad, maybe I should have a map. The area south and west uh, of the, uh, where am I? Uh, south and west of the Lake Chad Basin fell under French sphere of influence which subsumed Kanem, Wadai, and Bagirmi, while part of Borno went to the British. France had envisioned the united French colonial territory stretching from North Africa to the Sudan to the, to the Guinea coast. All of these kingdoms were socially and economically tied to Ottoman Libya. Some historians, particularly Turkish historians, <laughs> go as far as to classify all of these kingdoms as a tributary states officially uh, part of the Ottoman Empire when providing a detailed list of Ottoman provinces and zones of influence in the 19th century. Thus, the announcement of this agreement in 1890 was a clear message to Istanbul. Land that it had already claimed as its own based on the rules of the 1885 Act of Berlin from Libya's Mediterranean coast south all the way to Lake Chad Basin was being divided up without Ottoman consultation. 
The exclusion of Istanbul from this agreement traced the anger of the Sultan, he was always angry, and in response, a variety of diplomatic and tactical options were considered and deployed. Upon Istanbul's request, the Ottoman ambassador took the verbal protest of the Sultan to Lord Salisbury. The message was couched in the language of the General Act of Berlin. The complaint was that the British-French agreement infringed on the rights of the Ottoman government to its own colonies, Istanbulakat. The word province actually was written and then scratched out to be like it. Um, was, uh, the use of the word colonies is indicative of a new language Istanbul was trying to get used to when forwarding its claim over territories in Africa to its European counterparts. These colonial possessions, including Wadai, Borno Khan, and Mambagirmi, essentially the subjects of the Franco-British were essentially the subject of the Franco-British Agreement of 1890. In response to, uh, to Ottoman protests, Lord Salisbury simply gave instructions for a letter of vaguely worded, vaguely where everything is vaguely worded, vaguely worded assu assurances to be sent to the Sultan, stating that the British government would make sure to protect the interest of the Ottoman Empire without making any specification on how that would address the Sultan's grievances over colonial territorial claims. Perhaps what was not being said at the time spoke louder than what was. An incident almost comical in its absurdity highlights this fact. For while the Ottoman ambassador, Rustem Pasha, was in an adjacent office waiting to meet with Lord Salisbury uh, over this very issue, he came across a hand-drawn map of Africa, unintentionally left out on the desk, which he later learned was agreed upon and drawn up in Rome. This map of Africa marked the possessions of each, uh, I don't know how, let me see if I can get it. No, sorry, but there. This map of Africa marked the possessions of each colonial power with a different color, and its implications were much wider than the announced territorial claims in the Lake Chad Basin. What was injurious to Ottoman interests, according to the Ottoman ambassador, was that the area that was supposed to be under the rule of the Ottoman government around Lake Chad, Lake Chad had already been colored to indicate French rule in pink. This episode is a telling example of how the Ottoman government was often placated with empty promises while decisions were being made behind closed doors. Of course, Istanbul, was the, uh, uh, as the record shows, was well aware of what was taking place. But what was hard uh, uh, pressed to keep, uh, but was hard pressed to keep appearances and the diplomatic channels open. Following this incident, the Ottoman ambassador in London delivered a more strongly worded <laughs> protest to the British. The Ottomans are great at like upping the ante with their language. Anyway, uh, they're just like, anyway, uh, <laughs> British foreign, kind of like Arab leaders now. Has anybody re read anything that the Saudi Arabian dude writes? Oh, yeah. It's all blah, 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 anyway. <laughs> uh, in which the Ottoman government stated that it would not stand still and allow Borno, Borno specifically, to be considered part of the British sphere of influence. He reiterated that Borno was directly tied to the Ottoman Empire through historical and economic ties it has with the Libyan provinces and that Istanbul considered it an integral part of the Libyan hinterland. At this point, the French and the British response was also more direct. <laughs> In a letter from the French uh, Foreign Ministry, the French government assured the Ottoman government, uh, the Ottoman government that the French parliament confirmed the Ottoman right to rule Tripolitania. Like there's a twist in, they already, you know, we know Tripolitania is an Ottoman province, they've already established that. There's like a weird kind of like, we're going to give you this even though you already have it. This happens a lot now, by the way. If you, if you listen to diplomatic, if you listen to Trump, uh, you really find this kind of like slight of words where it's like, wait a second, what? Thank you, but I already have it. Anyway. <laughs> However, the French government considered the disputed territory to be outside the direct rule of the Ottoman government. <coughs> they strongly disagreed with Istanbul's claim to the Lake Chad Basin as being part of the Libyan hinterland. The French minister at the time, Alexandre uh, Ribot, even went as far as claiming what constituted a hinterland was up for debate. Especially since, according to him, the word itself was German yes. and not inherently clear. <laughs> <laughs> The lack, it's really, it's, there's so much of this, the whole book of that. The lack of familiarity with this term was in fact an excuse used several times to explain how the borders of zones of influence were always up for negotiations. Similarly, British embassy staffs in Istanbul told an Ottoman official that since they were ignorant of the German language, they would not be able to debate the meaning of words such as hinterland, 
and thus could not comment on the validity of Ottoman claims. Was the disagreement between Britain and the, uh, British and Ottoman officials really about understanding of a word in a foreign language? Of course it wasn't. This was, a demonstrate, this was a demonstration that vague wording was put in place to keep the options of the great powers open, open for debate, and open for their reinterpretation. The failure of diplomatic protests and grievances submitted on behalf of the Ottoman Empire made it painfully clear to many within the Ottoman government that establishing facts on the ground was more important than international law. This was summed up perfectly in a letter from an Ottoman military advisor by the name of Muhammad Shakir Pasha Ibn Muhammad, which I will get to in a second. So this is, this is where things get complicated and people get nervous. <laughs> this is an argument I made in an article that made a Europeanist very angry. Um, basically, in it, in very, very simplistic terms, I say that uh, 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 there, the, the logic behind, behind not international law, but how international law was allowed to be deployed is really based on this notion of a three civil, uh, the three tiers of civilization in which international law is married to who is civilized, who is uncivilized, and who is semi-civilized. Let allow me. This is my kind of like calculus background coming out, but just, it doesn't mean. Let me just read this for it. So, civilized is reserved for a European state and part of the family of nations. That therefore, legal system. Its its legal system is respected. Its internal legal system is respected. Therefore, sovereignty is fully respected. Therefore, can partake in inter-imperial system of agreements, treaties, and international law. Barbarian or semi-civilized in which the Ottomans were often classified, and arguably not part of the family of nations. Therefore, local legal system acknowledged, but not respected by Europeans. This is very, this is exactly what happens in the Ottoman Empire. Sovereignty, it's good for your people, it's not good for our people, we have our own courts, because your legal system is not good enough, we don't recognize it the way we recognize public law in, in Europe. Sovereignty, respected in certain circumstances, it says, is conditionally accepted in certain circumstances or accepted vis-a-vis -vis certain arenas of rule and not others. Can sometimes partake in interstate agreements, treaties, with no guarantees that they would be respected by European counterparts. So you're allowed onto the table, that doesn't mean we'll let you eat. Uh, but you're allowed in the door. It's much better than the rest of the world, which is the third. Um, but that also leaves the Ottoman Empire in a very interesting, for a historian, an interesting place where you can study international law and how it's deployed or not deployed. Because it's not written off right off, uh, and at the same time, it is, they have to, the Europeans have to grapple with the fact that in 1856, they admitted them in, they still come to, they, they sign these legal agreements, how do we deal with it in a way that would maintain our superior uh, um, uh, uh, interests in the colonies particularly. That's where sovereignty comes in. I'm almost done, stay with me. I believe that when it comes to, uh, uh, it's not what I thought about when I was writing the first book, is that all of this was about colonialism, right? It's about if you deny colonialism, uh, if, uh, who gets to be a, colo a, a colonial power and who doesn't. And in which terms can the Europeans couch their disagreement with the non-European power by using all sorts of like, you know, sleight of hand things about diplomacy? In reality, it, uh, the impact is, is much larger. Uh, part of it, what I used to get, a lot of the questions that I used to get is that why are the Ottomans even bothering trying to get the Sahara? Like, what is that about? Like, is it, are there any economic benefits? Are there any, of course, now there is tons of economic benefits. Uh, as you know. Uh, but back then there was nothing. There was like trade routes that went through it, which is of course very important, but beyond that, my answer was always, there's trade routes that went through it. <laughs> um, the reality is not really about, about uh, asserting their right to a land, it's about asserting their right to sovereignty. It, you, it's, it's a moment in time where you're either part of an international community, which means you're allowed to colonize, if you're not allowed to colonize, that means you're colonizable and your sovereignty is up for take. The place that the Ottoman Empire inhabited allowed it to negotiate, play with that game, but stay in the game. 
They couldn't say, oh, you're terrible, this, is, this doesn't make sense, I'm pulling out. Uh, they don't have that option. The only method of staying part of this international system of agreements is to play in the game that they lose at continuously, but are still invited to. That impacts not just their, the colonies that they want to get, but very early on, their claim to sovereign areas that are along uh, the boundaries. In this case, uh, I'm, uh, I go to the case of very obscure places. Um, not really that obscure. Who knows where Masawa is? Who has been to Masawa? Why am I talking like I'm lecturing? I'm so sorry. Uh, Masawa is, <laughs> I do this. Masawa is, is a really an amazing, actually it's a horrible city now, but it used to be an amazing city. Uh, it was uh, the first capital of the, of the Ottoman uh, uh, um, uh, province of, of Hejaz. Uh, even though it was on the other side of the, uh, the Red Sea. Um, uh, and until really the, the, uh, the mid 20th century, it was a really amazing, vibrant city, kind of uh, cosmopolitan city. But more importantly, it was an a, a very important port that was under the rule of the, of the Egyptians in the name of the Sultan. Another city that I've pointed out here is Kassala. It's very close, but it's more inland. Uh, Masawa is now part of Eritrea. Kassala is still part of Sudan, but it's very close to the border with Eritrea. Why are these important? <clears throat> because uh, at the same time that, in 1887, at the same time that they were arguing over the, the provinces in Libya, something else was taking place. Let me, let me uh, go back to reading so I will not confuse you. In April 1894, uh, I say April 1894 must have been a month of urgent meetings and endless discussions inside the boardrooms and hallways of the very, very dramatic uh, <laughs> boardrooms and hallways of Yildiz Palace Complex. Think of it as the White House of Istanbul at the time. In the span of a single year, Istanbul was shut out from several major agreements that would directly impact its uh, African interests. The events were so serious that in addition to diplomatic protests, which I talked about, it was reported that the Sultan himself asked Khedev uh, Abbas Hilmi II of Egypt to protect Ottoman domains, to cancel any official trips he had scheduled to London as a protest against the exclusion of Istanbul from negotiations taking place over territories. From the palace's perspective, the most important agreement of 1894 was between the British and King Leopold of Belgium in relation to the Congo Basin, which impinged on the sovereignty of the Sultanate of Wadai and the Khedev's possession, which is more important, in equatorial Africa, a province that some, in some sources is referred to as Equatoria. Khedev Ismail had uh, uh, conquered this area south of Khartoum in the name of Sultan Abdulaziz, but no substantial Ottoman presence was ever established. That is false. Um, uh, this is how it's usually couched when people talk about it, and since I've been doing research recently, so this is, <laughs> this is already kind of stale. Uh, since I've been doing research in, in, in the British uh, archives, I started to find out that in reality there was a lot of Ottoman presence. The Ottoman presence was not recognized by the British, because at the moment you recognize Ottoman presence, that means you have to deal with it legally. There were people with Ottoman uniforms uh, uh, guarding the port, and that mm -hmm. caused them a lot of problems. I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> the area discussed in the British-Belgian agreement was considered part of Egyptian Sudan and an extended region of Egyptian hinterland. Upon hearing of the British-Belgian agreement, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid engaged the office of the legal council, or Istishara Odasi, in Istanbul to determine its legality and asked the Ottoman special commissioner in Egypt, um, I'll spare you his name, for a map showing which African territories theoretically belonged to Egypt, uh, to the Egyptian province, even if these uh, areas were no longer under Egyptian military control. Additionally, the Sublime Port sent an official order to the Khedev to use all means necessary to protect the Egyptian hinterland. However, while Istanbul waited for a response from the Khedev, which never came, the crisis took a very serious turn. For despite Ottoman protests in Istanbul, an agreement was drafted on the, on, in April 1894, 12th of April 19, 1894, stating that the Great Britain undertakes to give to His Majesty King Leopold II a lease of territory in the western basin of the Nile. So the, the deal was done. The Ottoman government immediately denounced this agreement and declared it illegal, arguing that it considered the area included in this Anglo-Belgian agreement to be uh, Ottoman for two reasons. First, 
the area east of the Sultan of Wadai fell under the purview of the Khedif of Egypt. Uh, of Egypt. Second, Wadai was defined by the Ottoman state as part of its hinterland. We've done that. On several occasions in 1894, the Ottoman ambassador in London communicated the port's grievance over the British claim to Wadai. Rustum Pasha restated the Ottoman Empire's claim to all of the hinterland of Libya and Benghazi as clearly justified by the agreement in the Act of Berlin. In response, the British gave more empty promises. Lord Kimberley, the British Secretary of State for International Affairs, communicated to Rustum Pasha that Britain would protect Istanbul's rights in Wadai, without explaining how. He also advised the Sublime Port to maintain its vigilance because the French and the Italians were coming. <laughs> the French were not the only threat to Ottoman interests, even though they were. They were literally troops moving into Central Africa. Even though the Italians did not invade Ottoman Libya until 1911, the Ottoman government learned of Italian colonial ambitions as early as 1887, which is where I want to take you back. In that year, a secret agreement between Italy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Germany was negotiated to give Rome, in principle, the green light to occupy Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. The same year as the agreement over Italian ambitions in Ottoman Libya were being negotiated, the Ottoman embassy in, Ro uh, in, in Rome and local informants on the ground confirmed increased military activity not in Libya, but in Musalla a city on the Red Sea coast which had been under Khedival rule and thus nominally part of the Ottoman Empire. In 1895, jumping, reports from the Ottoman Embassy in Germany warned of more Italian, secret Italian talks talking, uh, taking place with the British and the Egyptians over Kassala. The agreement between Britain and Italy granted uh, Italy rule over Kassala, a district or Sanjak of the province of uh, Egyptian Sudan on the Red Sea coast along today's Sudanese uh, uh, Eritrean border. This agreement triggered yet another round of, uh, of Ottoman official protests, but to no avail. An Ottoman officer w uh, who was in Rome at that time provided the Ministry uh, of External Affairs with a new map drawn up during these negotiations, which is what you see. Istanbul's anger of its uh, over they're always angry. Istanbul angers over its exclusion from these negotiations, evident in an unsigned rough draft of a note from 13 August, allow me to read this to you. The note reflected the anger and desperation of the Sublime Port. Quote, just like the farce that took place in the time of the Grand Vizier of Kamil Pasha that resulted in the Italian occupation of Mosawa in 1887, now there is another farce, but it's much graver. The announcement of the Italian-British agreement over Casala in the Ottoman province of Equatoria in 1894 was the last straw. The taking of Casala, the author of the note noted, <laughs> should be protested in the strongest of terms because silence would be interpreted as consent. That's very important. This is legalese for you keep protesting and it will have an impact. I'll tell you in a second now. He pointed out that when the British and the Italians had previously been questioned, they assured the port that Istanbul would be involved if there were any serious decisions to be made, which is what part of the Act of Berlin. This agreement would not be the only Italian agreement in 1894 to raise the ire of the Ottoman government, for Italian negotiations over the Libyan territories continued. Why do I say this is going from colonialism to sovereignty? Those areas, so Mosawa, Kassala, and a territory that, that I didn't mention here, but becomes incredibly important. It's, uh, it's a place I've never heard of until I actually started working on it. It's called Zayla. Who know? I've never heard of Zayla. Zayla is, is a port city uh, in today's Somalia. In today's Somalia. The reason it is so important is because it was right adjacent to Djibouti, which the French at that time were actually building into a base and then creating a train that would go from Djibouti to Harar. The British claimed Zayla. I wish I had, I should have a map. Got all these maps and I can't even demonstrate this. Hold on. Yeah. So Zayla is right there. Mm -hmm. And Djibouti is right next to it. So the British claimed Zayla as their own. Zayla, just like Kassala, just like Musawa, was officially part of the Ottoman Empire and more disturbingly, uh, for the British, it still had uniformed people that were on the payroll. So what do, can a British Empire do to claim this territory that the, that the Ottoman Empire is refusing to give up, that is legally part of the Ottoman Empire, 
but they cannot actually just take it because the Ottomans were still members of it. So this is not even about claiming a new territory, it's about actually usurping the sovereignty of, an, of a European power. This is where lawyers become very creative. That's all I've been reading for the last couple of weeks. I, I want to give you um, a sample of what to do when you want to do something illegal without sounding like you're, uh, you're a hypocrite. The, I'm going to go to that. I'm to express that Lord Salisbury thanks, uh, uh, thanks uh, for these papers with regards to the suggestion uh, made at the conclusion that the question w uh, 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 whether Zayla can... I can't see... Geez, is that me old? <laughs> Zayla uh, can properly be concluded, uh, c concluded as formerly part of the Ottoman Empire, coming under the guarantee of the Treaty of Paris of 1856. I'm to say that, this, that Salisbury <laughs> doubts the utility of referring to the law. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, 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 what is it? Uh, differs, or whatever. A question which has not pr uh, practically arisen and may never arise. Which means, pack it up. <laughs> like <laughs> this, this insistence on actually saying when it comes to the Ottoman Empire that we are not just going to say we're going to uh, 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 occupy a land that is yours because we are legal Europeans doing legal things, but in reality is, it continues, but it actually expresses the, 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 um, uh, the intention behind international law. This notion that I talked about between the civilized, uncivilized, or whatever, is really what is driving not law by the, wor the lo word of the law, but actually how law is being interpreted and then, and, and then uh, asserted. Of course, you know that that only accelerates until World War I. So the notion that only in World War I did the British and the French start to uh, claim sovereign land in the Ottoman Empire is false, but it works from a British perspective if we were to believe the legality of it. So, the Ottomans do not give up on this. Actually, this is, this is the book I'm working on now. That's why it's, it all, it's, uh, it's really fresh. Uh, the Ottomans do not give up. Uh, they, they, like uh, the British, like the French, and the Italians, after the Battle of Adawa, which is in 1895, 18, 1894, 1895, need the Ethiopian emperor, who is in an expansionist mode as well, to support their claim to a lot of these cities along the coast. Uh, Italy is claiming a lot of the cities along the coast, the French are claiming Djibouti, and the British are claiming what is now Somaliland. The, the British are offering uh, um, a military and financial aid. The, the French are offering technology, they're building a train from Djibouti to Harar, which by the way, the Chinese just rebuilt and now it's uh, operating. Um, uh, the Turks are actually building another train in, inside of whatever. Uh, so that similar kind of like getting into the game is actually happening, this notion of a new scramble for Africa, which is problematic, but whatever. Um, uh, so the British and the French and the Italians are way off their head. Uh, they negotiate at one point and then they fight with the Ethiopians, they get beaten and they go back, and, but uh, with the British helping them. The, the Ottomans, on the other hand, are using, they start to use something else. They use the same dude that I showed you at the beginning, I don't want to go back to him, Azim Zadeh, who starts negotiating something that people have never really kind of wanted to, people thought that Azim Zadeh went to Ethiopia because he was representing Islamdom for the Sultan and, and mm -hmm. to talk with men in the, because they were representing Christendom for the Ethiopians. Yeah. Uh, the reality of it is that uh, the, uh, uh, he was actually part of this negotiation that was asked, that was using what the Ottoman Empire had to offer Menelik II in support, in to, where he would actually then offer the support strategically for the Ottomans to get their claim. And it's this piece of loveliness. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's really, it looks like nothing, but it's incredibly, incredibly precious. It is a piece of real estate in Jerusalem. Uh, it's called Deir Sultan. That the Copts, the Armenians, and the, uh, and the Ethiopians have been fighting over since the middle of the 19th, actually before the middle of the 19th century. There's other real estate in Jerusalem as well that, uh, that uh, Menelik II wants to have. 
that sultans start negotiating with Menelik II using the real estate that he has control over, even with the risk of angering the cops. You don't want to anger the cops, <laughs> because the Russians come knocking, uh, even at the risk of answer, uh, angering the cops and, and the Armenians. Um, all of this, why? For a piece of land in Musawa? No. It's, uh, as I said, it is you, the moment you, you acquiesce, your sovereignty is at stake, you are out of the European system. Um, this is where this talk ends. Um, I am more than happy to answer any questions you have. I, as you can tell, the rest of it is, is a work in progress, uh, and, and I, I, I welcome any questions you have about what I said or suggestions about what I can do in the future. Thank you.